from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Sarah Lancaster and Lily Wadashevsky will talk about their ongoing research on cover crops as a weed control practice and the effect of grazing on a cover crop's ability to suppress weeds. They're currently measuring that at five sites around Kansas. Also today from the Farm Service Agency, Josh Reeder reminds you producers about the availability of USDA farm operating loans, which can finance a wide variety of production agriculture expenditures. He'll go over the loan terms and the eligibility criteria. And on this week's edition of Milk Lines, K-State's Mike Brook will take a look at several dairy management considerations for optimum milk quality. All that here on Agriculture Today. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Right here, we're going to draw from one of the presentations that was made at a K-State cover crop field day in Ellsworth County this past week. Now, it looked at several aspects of cover crop production and the function of those crops, and one of those is for weed suppression. The question that was addressed, will grazing those cover crops affect that weed control aspect of those crops? Joining us now, K-State Weed Management Specialist Sarah Lancaster and one of her graduate researchers who is directly working on this, Lily Watashevsky. Before we bring Lily in to outline her work, and it's very interesting at that, Sarah, what do we know about cover crops and what they can do for us in weed control? As you know, Eric, and you alluded to, producers are going to adopt cover crops for a variety of reasons, only one of which is weed suppression. So I always kind of preface these comments with the fact that I am focused on killing weeds or suppressing weeds, not necessarily deriving all of the other ecosystem services that can be provided by cover crops. So when we think about cover crops and weed suppression, there's really three things going on there. The cover crops are changing the environment in which those weeds are trying to germinate and grow. So they're changing the temperature, the moisture availability, light availability is a key one. Um, Those cover crops are also, once they become established, competing with the weeds. So if the cover crops are there extracting the available water and nutrients more aggressively than the weeds are, that's going to help suppress the weeds. And then the third thing that tends to be a little more difficult to discern exactly what's going on is allelopathy. So some cover crops produce chemicals that actually suppress weeds, sort of like herbicides do. Um, So there's three factors going on there. Now, one of the things that... I have observed, and the research is starting to bear this out, is that grazing is is a good use of cover crops, right? And farmers like that, it helps them to extract some value from those cover crops. But my question was, and what Lily is, is working on here, is how much can we graze those cover crops before we start to affect the ability of those covers to suppress weeds through those three mechanisms that we just talked about? Because producers want to preserve both benefits, as it were, for forage production as well as weed control. Right. And so, you know, maximizing the benefit of forage production means we're going to take as much biomass as we absolutely can, right? But when we think about weed suppression, we want biomass. The number one driving factor for determining how well a cover crop will suppress weeds is biomass production. So those those two things can potentially come into conflict. Yeah. Let's bring Lily in to tell us what she's doing to address this question. And and you've taken this to the field, looking at the effect of grazing on cover crops. Let's start with this, Lily. What types of cover crops are you utilizing in this research? Yeah, so we have a variety of cover crops that we're looking at. Um, A couple of mixtures are including um, cereal rye, triticale, which are two of our main grasses that we see as cover crops being used, as well as some of our brassicas, such as turnips and radish. And then we're seeing a few legumes in there, such as red clover, as well as winter peas. And you're turning cattle out on these cover crops during what period? 
Yep. So we're currently working on farm with producers. So we're not setting that grazing schedule. So what we're doing is we are working with the farmers and when they decide it's time to turn out. Um, So we have had uh, producers start grazing anywhere from November and we've had producers start grazing anywhere from February start. So some of the producers are grazing very heavily and will only graze for four weeks. And we have some producers who are grazing um, very lightly over the fall and winter and springtime. Some of those producers are going on, I think, three months now. So um, a large variety um, of practices is what we're looking at. Um, so we're getting a lot of variety as well, samples coming in with that. So gives you a good uh, spectrum of data here, yep, yep, uh, to yep. look at. Yeah, we really want to make sure that we encompass what our producers in Kansas are doing. So we figured the best way to do that is to do on-farm research so we get a grasp of how they're actually interacting with their cattle on cover crops. And, of course, these were planted this past fall, each of these. Yep, yep, all planted past fall. A variety of planting dates. Some folks were um, interceding into the previous crops, so that'll give us an earlier planting date. Um, and then some producers were um, planting right before wintertime um, later in the fall period. So wide variety of planting dates, which affects the biomass. But again, we get that variety of farming practices, so we can take a look at all of it. Tell how you're measuring this and getting an an idea of the impact on cover crop weed suppression and, in fact, the grazing patterns of cattle in this respect. Yeah, so the idea was to um, take a look at a field that is being grazed and to simulate the removal of grazing over periods of time on that same field. So what we have done is uh, we'll go to the field before it's being grazed and then we'll go every two weeks um, up until I think about eight weeks. And what we do there to simulate the removal of grazing is we'll place these metal fenced in exclosures. Uh, where the cattle cannot graze. So we're able to take samples from those every two weeks, and then we can get an idea of the biomass that is out there as far as the cover crop biomass and as far as the weed biomass that is out there. Um, So within those exclosures, um, we'll take samples right away when those are put out there. And then later on, uh, when grazing has finished or before the cover crop is terminated, we'll go back to those exclosures and take a look at if the cover crop has regrown since they've been taken off at two weeks or if it's regrown even more, taken off at four weeks and so on. So we can make those comparisons after the grazing season is done since we simulated the removal of grazing on that field. Biomass is the main factor or variable that we are taking, but we're also taking a look at heights of the cover crop uh, with grass species. That's very important. Um, And we're also taking a look at a new app called Canapeo, which measures ground cover area. So that's something easy for producers to use to estimate biomass that is on the ground. You're really covering the waterfront here (laughs) with, with all of this. And you're looking for specific weed growth at this point, winter annuals. And soon, summer annuals? Yep. So the, primarily the weeds that we are seeing right now are winter species, whether that be winter annuals or biannuals. So common weeds that we'll, we've been seeing in the field right now are chickweed, henbit, mare's tail are primarily the main weed species that we've been seeing. Um, however, the weed species composition is going to change as it continues to warm up here um, in springtime and as we get more rainfall. Um, so we'd anticipate seeing our summer, early emerging summer annuals start coming up, um, as well as our cover crop regrowing quite a bit. So it'll be interesting to see um, the comparisons that we can make between that cover crop regrowth as well as the weed species regrowth. Haven't mentioned yet, you're conducting this at five separate locations, fairly well distributed throughout the eastern two-thirds of Kansas? Yes, sir. So we decided to stay in central and eastern Kansas due to uh, more adaptability of cover crops due to the moisture uh, regime within the state of Kansas. So our five locations are in Hutchinson, Ellsworth, Clay Center, Wamigo, which is right outside of Manhattan, and then Topeka. Well, Lily, this goes on. You haven't finished this project yet, but you say that there are some early indicators as far as the impact of grazing those cover crops on their weed control. Yeah, so one of the main things that we have seen so far that I believe is super interesting is that 
as our cover crop biomass goes down, as the cattle are eating, our weed biomass is also going down. So something that we can infer from that is that our cattle are eating those weeds just as much as they're sl- they're not selecting just for cover crop. So when those winter annual weeds are in a young vegetative state, the cattle don't mind eating those weeds. Um, so that's in- an interesting fact that grazing could possibly even help with weed suppression for winter annuals in particular because they're grazing the weeds just as much as they're grazing the cover crops so far. That's a major finding if it holds up, isn't it, in as far as the compatibility of the two objectives here? Yep, yep. Well, that's one of the findings I didn't expect to find, Uh, but our main goal is going to be to just compare those different grazing periods and see if we can compare the different biomasses and give those producers um, a recommendation on when to remove grazing of cover crops to maximize their weed suppression uh, because it's very important for producers to remain profitable with cover crops and make it make sense on their farm um, and grazing plays a key role in that. Sarah as a weed scientist your takeaway from this work this could prove to be well, illuminating as far as the use of cover crops for multiple purposes. I think so, Eric. I think what we're going to do is end up confirming that as long as there's adequate biomass there when summer annual weeds are starting to emerge, that grazing is totally compatible with using cover crops for weed management. You're continuing this, though, for a little while yet, right? Yep, little? yep. So all of our samples um, taken to date, we aren't finished yet. So most of our samples have been primarily on those winter annuals. Uh, but we'll go back in and sample later this spring before cover crop termination to be able to look at the comparisons between summer annuals because for a lot of producers, winter annuals might not mean a whole lot to them um, as far as the summer annuals where there's more competition with the crops. So we're anticipating to see more results with our summer annuals coming up, uh, which will make a lot more sense to producers as we get those results in. Really interesting, the findings to date and wishing you the best in rounding this off and coming to firm conclusions at the end of it. And Lily, thanks for reporting on your work right here. Appreciate yes. it. Thank you, Eric. Sarah, thank you as well. As always, thanks, Eric. Joining Sarah Lancaster, weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension, one of her graduate researchers, Lily Watashevsky, and she is working on various cover crop types and their ability to not only suppress weeds, but to function in that capacity even as they are grazed. She is conducting this at five locations around the state of Kansas, at Ellsworth, Hutchinson, Wamego, Clay Center, and Topeka. We'll return with more on Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today returns now on the K-State Radio Network. And once more, the latest out of the Farm Service Agency, state headquarters for Kansas. Along with us now is the Farm Loan Chief with the Kansas FSA, Josh Ritter. Josh, you always bring news about the various loan programs that fall under the heading of the USDA, uh, and you do so again today. What have you selected to share with us here? Yeah, hi, Eric. I think today what I'd like to talk about is a program we talked about before, but I I wanted to bring up uh, FSA's Direct Farm Operating Loan Program again Mm -hmm. and just point out that the funds for our Direct uh, Farm Operating Loan Program are provided directly to the producer by the FSA, and the loans are made and serviced by FSA. Uh, Funds for this loan type can be used to finance farm operating expenses. And couldn't be more timely in that respect with cropping season right at our doorstep now. When you say that the program is used to finance operating expenses, we need to be more specific about that here, don't we? Yeah, I think that would be helpful to everybody listening. Um, When I say that, really it's for a variety of different purposes this program can be used for, but one of the primary purposes is to purchase machinery, equipment, and livestock that are necessary for the farm operation. Uh, The program can also be used to finance annual farm operating expenses, which would include, you know, feed, seed, fertilizer, pesticides, farm supplies, and cash rent payments also. Uh, Funds can be used for costs associated with reorganizing a farm to improve profitability, An example of this would be to purchase equipment needed to convert from a conventional to no-till production or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. And also the program can be used to refinance non-real estate farm-related debts. So there are several different ways that producers can take advantage of FSA's operating loan program to help expand their operations and improve profitability. Quite a bit of latitude there as far as what those loans can be applied to under the USDA FSA rules. 
we talk about the stipulations and the terms of loans here, and you would pass along information along that line. Yeah, yeah. First, um, the maximum loan amount available under the Direct Farm Operating Loan Program is four hundred thousand dollars, and that's a cumulative total. So, if a producer has an outstanding two hundred thousand dollar operating loan, they could apply for another direct operating loan up up to an additional two hundred thousand dollars. Uh, the repayment terms vary based on what the loan purpose is, but they cannot exceed seven years ever. Uh, annual operating loans are generally repaid within 12 months or when the commodity is produced or sold. And the interest rate for the program is currently 2.75%. That interest rate is adjusted monthly, but once the loan is closed, that interest rate is locked in and fixed for the life of the loan. So pretty straightforward there across the board. As far as eligibility for USDA farm operating loans, what need be met in order to qualify? Yeah, there are several different eligibility criteria that a producer will need to work through with their local FLP office. But there are a couple of general thoughts to keep in mind. And the first is if a producer can obtain sufficient credit elsewhere at reasonable rates and terms, then the producer will not be eligible for a direct loan through FSA. We don't compete with commercial lenders. Mm -hmm. Also, direct operating loans require applicants to have sufficient education, training, or at least one year's experience in managing or operating a farm or ranch within the last five years. Uh, to meet this requirement through education, the applicant needs to have completed an educational program in agriculture. This would include either a two- or four-year degree from a college in ag business, horticulture, animal science, agronomy, or other related ag field. To meet the requirement through farm experience, the applicant has to have been an owner, manager, or operator of a farm business for at least one entire production cycle. Uh, this is generally shown through production records and income and expense records like a Schedule F from a tax return. All right. So those are the basics of the USDA's farm operating loan program for active commercial agricultural producers out there. Saying that because there is this side program we did want to mention likewise. It's a youth loan program. It falls within the scope of the overall farm operating loan setup here. But what are these youth loans about? Yeah, these uh, our FSA youth loan program, it's available to kids and young adults between the ages of 10 and 20. Uh, the maximum loan amount for the program is $5,000, and the interest rate is currently the same as a regular uh, OL interest rate, which is 2.75%. Uh, the youth loan project must provide an opportunity for the for the kid or young person to acquire experience in education and agriculture related skills, and the project must be sponsored by an advisor such as a 4-H club, FFA, tribal youth organization, or similar agriculture affiliated group. I mean, the program really offers a great venue for kids to become familiar with the loan making process and get experience with financial management with the help of an advisor. A lot of the time, the program is used to fund a fair project and gives the opportunity for some kids to buy a steer, heifer, or pig, et cetera, that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to do so. It's uh, just, uh, I mean, we've had really good experience with it as an agency, and it's really helpful to the kids and just kind of a fun program for everybody involved. So if a parent would like to get their youngster headed down this path and be involved in this youth loan program, more or less the same approach as far as pursuing that? Yeah, they, they would just need to contact their local FSA office, and they, they'll get them in contact with their local FLP office, servicing office, and then they can work through that loan application process with them. It's obviously a much simpler process than it is for our, for our other exactly. loans, but similar in, in who we need to contact and work through. Very well. So if you have a youth who would like to get their feet wet in, in securing loans for whatever project they have going, why, this is a great way to do it through the FSA. And broadening our visit here a little further, you had some updates to share with us as far as doing business at that farm service agency local counter. Yeah, first I'd like to share that our local offices are getting back to what we would consider more normal operations. Currently, all of our county offices are able to be staffed at a 75% level, which is not where we want to be, but getting closer to where we want to be. And it's great that we're able to have more employees back in the office. Also, the agency has relaxed our protocols for uh, most of our offices. So in most cases, producers are no longer required to make an appointment to be able to enter their local offices. And we've also done away with masking requirements in offices where certain criteria are met. Uh, I'd still recommend contacting that local office before showing up at the door just to make sure they're in that area and, and an appointment is not needed. But it, it's just nice for us and our customers 
that we're getting closer to being able to have the same interactions we had prior to this pandemic starting. I mean, it's been a long time coming, and we're we're happy that we're moving forward. Slowly but surely progressing on that front. Again, if you have any questions about the USDA's farm operating loans, how you might qualify producers, do pay a visit. Contact them first via phone to your local FSA office and the farm loan program headquarters nearest you, and they will get you all squared away on obtaining such a loan should you qualify. And Josh, as always, thank you for coming over and passing along information to us. Yep, thanks for having me on, Eric. I appreciate it. He is the farm loan chief with the Kansas FSA state headquarters, which is here in Manhattan. That's Josh Ritter. Now, there's another item on the USDA farm program calendar, and We're right in the middle of this, the sign-up for the Grassland Conservation Reserve Program. That'll continue through mid-May. It is advertised as a unique opportunity for farmers, ranchers, and other agricultural landowners to keep that land in agricultural production and supplement their income while improving the soil and the permanent grass cover on that acreage. We had a conversation about that a couple of weeks back with... FSA Conservation Program Specialist Carla Wyckoff. Our sign-up will run through May 13th. The purpose of this program is a practice to maintain existing vegetative cover of either introduced or native grasses and legumes uh, on eligible ground. So eligible land could be any land that, that contains forbs or shrublands. This includes any improved ranch land or pasture land for which grazing is the predominant use. This could be expiring CRP, which might make it a little more of interest to some people. So NRCS is our technical provider, and they do a site visit to look at the grass and determine uh, if it's suitable, and then they develop a conservation plan for that acreage. And the purpose is to preserve that grassland and keep development out, quite frankly? Right. That is, um, it's a voluntary program, and that's one of its goals is to kind of limit that future development and cropping uses. But it does allow conducting common grazing practices and operations related to the production of forage and seeding. There are a little bit of restrictions on that as far as haying is concerned when it comes to the primary nesting season. And in Kansas, that primary nesting season is April 15th through July 15th. So uh, within that conservation plan that NRCS puts together for the land, that information will be in there. So producers will want to visit with their FSA office and NRCS office and kind of get a plan to move forward with this practice. Carla Wyckoff of the Farm Service Agency State Office. The grassland CRP providing participants who qualify with annual rental payments and cost share assistance, that rental rate will vary by county. The national minimum rental rate is $13 per acre, and the contract durations are anywhere from 10 to 15 years. Any landowners and producers interested in the grassland CRP should again get in touch with their local FSA office, and if they'd like more information, they can find it online at fsa.usda.gov. We'll return after this break. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Welcome back, and next for you on Agriculture Today, the weekly edition of Milk Lines from K-State Research and Extension Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. The accent this week on milk quality and the variables influencing that on a given dairy. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy producers concerning the trends that we've been seeing in butterfat and milk protein tests over the last year here in the Central Order. Central Milk Market Administrator has uh, published the numbers from 2021 as well as uh, previous years, and it's really interesting what we see. Uh, You might recall that a few years back we started uh, being paid on the basis of the amount of protein and fat that's actually in in the milk that we're shipping. And in fact, the components generally account for more than 90% of the total 
amount in your monthly checks that you get for your milk from your dairy herd. So it's interesting when you start to emphasize those sorts of things, what happens and what motivates producers. For 2021, the average milk shipped on the central order averaged 3.98% butter fat and on the protein basis averaged 3.244%. That is much above the 22-year average of 3.75 for butter fat and 3.1 for protein. So, how have you been accomplishing that on your dairy? Well, there's probably several things that have contributed to this. Genetics, obviously, is one of those. And many of you, as you choose your sires for your herd, you look at components one way or another. Maybe not exactly looking at butter fat test or percent or milk protein percent, but looking at cheese yield or some other factor that takes that into account. Many of you use energy corrected or money corrected milk as well, which would take into account the components in your milk and helping you with sire selection. But that's not the whole story. A lot of it has to do with what we're doing with feeding animals. We're feeding animals much differently today than we did even 10 years ago. And as you work with your nutritionist, you're doing things in the rations to increase milk protein as well as milk butter fat. Now, are there still some opportunities? You guys have been doing a great job in terms of increasing the percentages, but do we have opportunities? Well, when we start looking at the monthly averages, particularly with butter fat, we still have a slump. Uh, That slump generally occurs in the summertime as we uh, go into uh, the warmer months. And that can be a fairly significant slump in our paycheck, too, as you, if you start looking at that. Typically averaging uh, only about 3.75% butter fat in the summertime on our herds in 2021, compared to, well, say December, our average was 3.88 or almost 3.9% on the butter fat shipped into the central order. So we do have some uh, things that we can look at during the summertime. Typically, we start losing on butterfat tests as early as March, but for sure in April, May, continues through August and September, and generally in October, it starts to rise. So it really fits over that summertime heat stress. So what are you doing for heat stress during the summertime? The other thing you might want to take into consideration is we also slump in protein percent during that same time. And, in fact, in 2021, our average protein percent during the month of July was only 2.98%. So about three-tenths below what we normally get in the cooler months of the year, November, December, being our higher months, generally speaking, compared to January and February. So while we're doing great and we've made great progress in increasing the solids content of the milk that we're shipping from our herds, we still have some opportunities. You might want to be thinking about what you're going to do to keep heat stress under control this summer on your farm, keeping in mind that those components will probably be worth much more this summer than what they have been in previous summers. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Mike, thanks, as always. And that brings our Tuesday edition to a close. Likewise, thank you for being along with us. And please rejoin us here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.